There's nothing our nations can't achieve if we do it together. I really mean it. So thank you all. God bless you all. Let's go. Let's go lick, lick the world. Let's get it done. This is my first video update from Nicosia, Cyprus on this Saturday morning. Let's talk about some news. And we start things off with another EU disaster trip to China. This one courtesy of German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock. And she lectured the Chinese non-stop about human rights, economic freedom, the Uyghurs, Russia. Annalena told the Chinese officials that if there were to be some sort of conflict with Taiwan, then it would be a disaster for Germany. So she warned China about escalation with Taiwan. She then said that China is the only country that could convince Russia and Russian President Vladimir Putin to stop the war in Ukraine. She said that after the meeting of Chinese President Xi Jinping in Moscow with Russian President Vladimir Putin, that it was obvious that China holds sway over Russia. And she said that Russia is the only country, the only country responsible for the conflict in Ukraine. And she urged China to tell Putin to stop the war. Germany in 2014, 2015, signed up to enforce the Minsk agreements. Former German Chancellor Angela Merkel in two interviews has admitted to the fact that Germany was never going to enforce the Minsk agreements and the Minsk agreements were just a way to buy time for Ukraine so that, so that it could rearm with NATO weapons and training and act as a battering ram against Russia and eventually cause some kind of regime change in Russia. And of course, Annalena forgot to mention that Germany continues to escalate the conflict in Ukraine by pouring in weapons and money to the Alensky regime, including German Leopard tanks. So Annalena did not mention any of that to the, uh, to the Chinese as she was lecturing them. And she just basically said that the entire conflict in Ukraine is Putin's fault and it is the Chinese fault for not telling Putin to stop the conflict in Ukraine. So China is also to blame. That was Annalena's message to the Chinese. And you can tell the Chinese were just kind of like, get her out of here. We are sick and tired of hearing these lectures from this EU German official. And as Annalena was lecturing the, the Chinese government about those EU values and those EU human rights, in France, we have protests, very, very violent protests, but the violence is coming from the Macron government. So the pension reforms that Macron decided to enact by passing the uh, parliament, well, those pension reforms, from what I understand, have now been legalized. They are now law. And so you had a lot more protests taking place over the last couple of days in France. And boy, the, uh, the French police, they are brutal. I mean, they are absolutely brutal. I have to say that when protests happen outside of the, of the collective West, things can get out of hand. But when protests happen in the collective West, I mean, the police brutality, they just take it to a whole nother level. I mean, a whole nother level. The videos 
that I've been seeing coming out of France and the way the police beat up the protesters is, is absolutely shocking. And the protests have gone way past pension reform. The protesters were outside of Black Rock's head headquarters last week. And this week they were outside of, uh, of Louis Vuitton and uh, what's, what's the other fashion brand? LV, LVMH, I think. I, I forgot the name of, of the other fashion brand. A huge fashion brand. The owner of this brand is like the, the richest or the second richest person in the world. But they were outside of, of those, uh, those fashion brand headquarters as well or offices as well. And this has moved well past pension reform. This is about a protest about Macron, his government, globalism, neoliberalism. But the French police, they are absolutely brutal. I mean, they are brutal. EU values, EU values and human rights. So Macron, he, uh, he arrived back to, to France after his trip to China and then a two, three day stop in the Netherlands. And he was back in France and he inspected the Notre Dame Cathedral, which had burned down a couple of years ago. I forgot the date when uh, they burned down the Notre Dame and he inspected the reconstruction efforts taking place at the iconic historic uh, church. And Macron urged the, uh, the workers at the Notre Dame to continue to, to rebuild the church. And the expected date to reopen is Christmas Day 2024. And then Macron, he, uh, he decided to, to speak to the reporters outside of the Notre Dame. And he started to talk about how the Alensky regime is burning down Orthodox churches in Ukraine. And he condemned the Alensky regime's actions as they burn down Orthodox churches in Ukraine. No, wait, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He didn't mention anything about the Alensky regime burning down churches in Ukraine. Not one word about how the Alensky regime is burning down Orthodox churches in Ukraine. Not one word about that. In Finland, they're building a wall. Yeah, they are building a wall so that the Russians can't get in. Or maybe they're building a wall so that people in Finland can't get out. <laughs> but uh, the Finnish authorities, post Santa Marin, post Dancing Queen, they are building a border wall with Russia. I believe the, the border wall is a three kilometer fence to be more precise near the boarding crossing with Russia. That is according to Bloomberg. And I thought walls were bad. Wasn't the collective West lecturing us about how building walls is evil. I guess it's not so bad and not so evil when you build a wall with Russia, that's acceptable. Building a wall in, uh, in the U.S. southern border, that's unacceptable. So one is good, one is evil. So that's what's taking place in Finland. An update, here we go, an update on Lula's trip to China. And during our live stream yesterday, me and Alexander, that we did on the Duran, we had a commentator tell us about a song that was played as Lula was visiting Xi Jinping. And the song that China played as Lula visited Beijing was Ivan Lin's 1980 song called 
Um Novo Tempo, translated into a new era. Um Novo Tempo. And so they played this song as Xi Jinping and Lula were walking the red carpet. Children were, were cheering as well, holding Chinese and Brazilian flags. And this song has a lot of meaning for, for Brazil, but it also has a lot of meaning for the, uh, for the event, the fact that Chinese played this song, A New Era, signifies a new era for the BRICS, for Brazil, for China. There's, there's a reason that the Chinese played this song as Lula was visiting the country and was received by Chinese President Xi Jinping. And the singer-songwriter of this song, Ivan Lintz, he actually commented on the fact that China decided to choose his song to play as Lula and Xi Jinping were walking the red carpet before their meetings in Beijing. And Ivan Lintz, he posted on social media, he said, quote, I am very excited. You can't imagine how much this means to me and Vitor Martins. The lyrics of Novo Tempo already in 1980 tried to raise the spirits of our beloved people, strengthening and filling everyone with hope for the freedom we would conquer five years later in reference to the end of the military dictatorship in 1985. So he was very happy that the Chinese chose his song to play as Lula was visiting Beijing. A song with, uh, with significance and meaning back then, and a song being played by the Chinese government with meaning and significance for today, for now. A new era, Um Novo Tempo, by Ivan Lintz. The Chinese, they are very, very good with, with subtle meanings. Very, very good. So a video that I did yesterday talked about the, the document leaker, the alleged document leaker, 21-year-old Jack Teixeira. And there was video that was released yesterday by the FBI as they apprehended this 21-year-old Massachusetts Air Force National Guardsmen, a whole bunch of FBI officials with all of their guns and, and their military outfits, they apprehended this 21-year-old Massachusetts National Guardsman who was dressed in, in a t-shirt and shorts outside of his home. They made a whole big, big deal about apprehending this alleged leaker. 21-year-old Air Force National Guardsman. And they want us to believe that this was the guy that leaked all of these documents about Ukraine and China and the Middle East and the U.S. Pentagon NATO war plans in Ukraine. This is the guy that leaked those documents. And I had some interesting comments from viewers on my video from yesterday where I talked a bit about this story. And I really didn't think about the connection between the arrest of Jack Teixeira and everything that happened in and around the Nord Stream sabotage. And I'm not saying they're connected, but I'm saying the, the way they went about going after Jack Teixeira and the way they have not gone about finding out what happened to the Nord Stream pipeline sabotage. So I'm going to read you a couple of comments, which I think were really, really smart, kind of connecting these two events. And let me know what you think in the comments down below. So one commenter said, how is it that they couldn't find the person responsible for the Nord Stream story, but somehow they managed to find this particular person? We know it's BS. Another commenter said, 
he, in reference to Jack Teixeira, he met four guys and a nurse off the coast on the Andromeda, and they handed him the documents. <laughs> Another comment said, 21-year-old leaked national secrets. A 21-year-old leaked national secrets. Six men in a boat blew up Nord Stream 2. We are in a world of superheroes. And then another commenter said, the leaked document story sounds like the five people on a recreational yacht story blowing up a pipeline. Interesting enough, the paper that first tried to provide an alternative narrative to Seymour Hersh's Nord Stream pipeline sabotage report was the New York Times. The New York Times didn't push the Andromeda, five guys in a yacht story. The New York Times pushed out a story talking about Ukrainian patriots and Russian patriots who hate Putin as the people that were behind the Nord Stream pipeline sabotage. And then the German media, a day later, even a couple of hours later, they pushed the story of the Andromeda, Gilligan's Island, five guys in a boat story. But the New York Times, they were the first U.S. publication to provide an alternative story to Seymour Hersh's Nord Stream article. And it was the New York Times that first reported on the document leaks. But isn't it interesting how with these document leaks, they, uh, they grabbed this 21-year-old Jack Teixeira very quickly and they got the cameras out and they showed the whole thing of the FBI grabbing this, this young kid. I call him a kid. He's a man, but a young man. But for, for me, I'm like, he's like a kid. And they grabbed this kid in his red shorts and t-shirt and uh, they arrested him. And now he's, he's going, he's already been charged actually. And he's going to go through the process and God help him. God only knows what the Biden White House is going to do to this young man. But they got to him very, very quickly and they, and they put it on social media and they want everyone to know that, uh, that they got the alleged leaker and that he is going to pay a very heavy price. And I said in a video two days ago that one of the purposes of, of all of this, this circus that we see playing out in front of us is for the Biden White House and the government to expand their surveillance and their control of the internet. They are going to use this to justify more surveillance and more spying on all of us. So they, they solved this mystery very quickly with the help of the New York Times and the Washington Post and Bellingcat. They actually helped the Biden White House find this, this alleged leaker via his gamer, his gamer discord channel or his gamer discord group that he was involved in. But with Nord Stream, nothing. The New York Times, ah, they're not going to help the Biden White House figure out who blew up Nord Stream. The Washington Post, ah, not interested in, 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 in a pipeline getting blown up. Who cares about that? It's not a big deal. It's just a pipeline carrying gas, which was blown up and caused a massive ecological, environmental disaster. Who cares about that? Who cares? That's not a big deal. Bellingcat, eh? <laughs> Nord Stream, eh? who cares about that? We're not going to... Uh, to help the Biden White House investigate that. <laughs> it was some it was some some Ukraine uh, nationalists and some Russian anti-Putin nationalists who did it. Or it was Gilligan the skipper, Ginger, Marianne the professor, the millionaire and his wife. <laughs> They're the ones that uh, blew up Nord Stream on the Andromeda yacht. <laughs> You notice how they don't really care about Nord Stream. The media, boy, were they quick to, uh, to help the Biden White House grab this alleged leaker. Nord Stream, eh, not really important. Anyway, great comments, great observations. 
from uh, from the viewers of the video yesterday. Very, very smart observations. I didn't think about Nord Stream and this incident and the differences between how both of these these stories, these events were handled by the Biden White House and and their mainstream media puppets, <laughs> because that is what, what accomplices, <laughs> that is what they are. So let's, let's now talk about, what should we talk about? Here's a big story. I think this is actually the main story for the, uh, for the day. And that is regime change, but not in Russia. They, oh, they, they want regime change in Russia, no doubt about it. They're dying for regime change in Russia. I mean, they, they, they live, sleep, eat, and breathe for regime change in Russia. But, but they have now decided to push for regime change in Hungary. They want Orban out. Boy, do they want him out. And The Guardian published an article yesterday with the title, Viktor Orban's Political Allies in Hungary in Sites of U.S. Sanctions. Congress group drafts legislation targeting officials and government supporters mainly affiliated to Fidesz party. That is Orban's party. Now keep in mind that Orban, he has won, I believe, five elections. Five. He has been elected five times to lead Hungary. Democratic elections. Elections that are absolutely free and fair. No one has disputed the validity of the elections that have taken place in Hungary. As a matter of fact, the last elections that took place for which Orban trounced the Fidesz party trounced the opposition, the EU, they actually put together like an umbrella group to oppose Orban. What they did is they said, okay, everyone that opposes Orban, all the opposition, the communists, the, uh, the far, far right, the centrists, the socialists, we don't care. Let's put you all under one umbre umbrella and that will give us the best chance to defeat Orban. So they took all of these opposing forces, all of the other opposition parties, opposition parties that, that despise each other under normal circumstances, and they put them all together, and they put them under one grouping, and they were hoping that that would deliver a defeat for Orban. And what happened? Orban trounced. I mean, he trounced the, uh, the opposition, this umbrella group that the EU had created during the last elections. So the EU, they have been going after Orban for many, many years. Well, now they have the support of the Biden White House and the United States. Trump, when he was president, he got along really well with Orban. He wasn't quite on board for a hungry regime change project. But Biden, oh, Biden, he does not like Viktor Orban because the Orban government, they just want to, uh, to be neutral in this whole Russia-Ukraine conflict. The Orban government, rightly so, they believe that the best thing for Ukraine to do is to sit down with the Russian government and talk peace. Because the Orban government, rightly so, they understand that Ukraine is losing the war and has already lost the war. As a matter of fact, Orban said the other day that Ukraine is financially a non-existent country. As soon as the US and Europe stop supporting it, the conflict will end. Exactly. That is exactly right. It runs counter to the narrative that someone like Annalena Baerbach brings to China, where she says that the minute the Chinese convince Putin to stop the war. Well, Putin will stop the war. Orban looks at it from a different angle. He says that we need to stop 
funding Ukraine. We need to stop pouring weapons into Ukraine. And that will get Alensky to the negotiating table and the conflict will end. Keep in mind that the Russians, they have given Ukraine nine years to come up with a peaceful solution to what is happening in that area. Nine years, starting with Minsk, Minsk one, Minsk two, the Normandy format with Russia, Ukraine, uh, Poroshenko, and then Alensky, Merkel, Hollande, and then Macron. And of course, a year leading up to the war, the Russians, once again, they asked the United States, they asked the EU, we need to come up with a security agreement, a security architecture for all our interests, for all our best interests. And Ukraine has to remain neutral. They have to stay out of NATO. And what was the response that the Russian government received? Now Ukraine's going to get into NATO. And not only are they going to get into NATO, but maybe it's not a bad idea if they got nuclear weapons. That was the response that the uh the putin government received so urban is is basically looking at this from a different angle the correct angle and he's saying let's stop this nonsense stop funneling weapons and money into ukraine and then we will get a peaceful solution because this is hurting europe and hungary does not want to go any further with sanctions against russia because Orban understands that more sanctions against Russia, especially for Hungary, is going to degrade the living standards and the quality of life and the economy for Hungary. But that's exactly what the European Union wants. You see, the European Union, they want Hungary to sanction Russian oil and gas. They want Hungary to stop cooperating with Rosatom on nuclear energy because they want the Hungarian economy to, to crash. Because for them, if the Hungarian economy crashes, well, then they have an excellent chance to remove Orban through the next elections. And of course, if the Hungarian economy crashes for the EU and the IMF and the World Bank and all of these groups, well, they have another, another victim, right? They have another victim to impose their EU globalist collective West austerity measures, like what they did to Portugal and Ireland and Greece and Cyprus and Spain and all of these countries. So they want regime change in Hungary. They absolutely want regime change in Hungary. Regime change for a country that is an EU member, that is a part of NATO, and they still want to regime change the Orban government. This is their ally. This is so supposedly Hungary is their friend. Hungary is their partner. But nope, they want Orban out. And now we understand the, the reasons for Samantha Power visiting Budapest a couple of months ago. She went to Budapest to meet with the media, the opposition media. I would I would guess that she probably met with uh, various forces that that can organize a protest when the time is right. I'm sure she met with those forces as well. And uh, she was laying the foundation for what would eventually come, which is now the sanctions escalator. So now they're putting Hungary on the sanctions escalator. Samantha Power paid her visit. She's She's talked to the opposition media, so they know what they need to do. I would, I would guess that she's talked to the NGOs and, and the universities and the groups that, that are really good with getting people out onto the streets to protest, like what we saw in Georgia. So I'm sure she's, she's mobilized those forces as well. And now we have the second layer, which is the sanctions escalator. And the goal is to degrade the Hungarian economy to, pl to put pressure on the Orban government and then to get the media and the protesters working to, to push for some sort of regime change. But don't look at what's happening in France. Don't look at the protests in France because those protests, those aren't sanctioned by the, by the European Union or the United States. They didn't give their approval for those protests, at least not yet. Mr. Burns is going to have to visit Macron to, 
to see if if Macron changes his tune with regards to China. If he doesn't change his tune, then who knows? Maybe maybe the Biden White House will start to to support the protests in France or maybe infiltrate <laughs> the protests in France. Anything is possible. So former CIA director and former U.S. Secretary of State under the Trump administration, Mike Pompeo, he has announced that he will not be running for president in 2024. He posted on Twitter the other day saying, Susan and I have conducted, have concluded after much consideration and prayer that I will not present myself as a candidate to become president of the United States in the 2024 elections. So that is Mike Pompeo bowing out of the elections for 2024. So Mike Pompeo, he, uh, he obviously has been tasked to do other things for the neocons and the warmongers and the globalists rather than running for president. They have tasked him to, to escalate the conflict, not only in Ukraine, but in China. And so Pompeo, he tweeted this out the other day. The Chinese Communist Party isn't just targeting the United States. They want to control the world, including Europe. Macron should remember that. Sounds like a threat. Macron should remember that. I'm telling you, these neocons, these guys like Pompeo, they are vicious, absolutely vicious. So Pompeo also said this during an interview on Fox News. One second, it's a bit windy as I cross over the bridge here. I'm just waiting for the wind to die down a bit. So Pompeo, in an interview on Fox Business, he said, the quickest and cheapest way to end this war is to give Ukraine the tools they need to convince Putin to end it. To convince Putin to end it. Hmm. Pompeo then tweeted, the only way to stop China's aggression is to convince the Chinese Communist Party there is a cost. Any sign of weakness is provocative. Convince China that there is a cost. Convince them. And Pompeo was on Fox News again the other day, and he said the Ukrainians have had enormous success, but real challenges remain, including an absence of, muni of munitions, thanks to President Biden's half measures. Pompeo. Pompeo talking about Biden's half measures. Give more money to Ukraine. Give them more money. Let's go back this way, actually. So that is what Pompeo has been tasked to do, to ramp up the war effort in Ukraine, the proxy war in Ukraine, and to escalate things in China. And Bloomberg is reporting from Ukraine that the EU is becoming more skeptical about the counteroffensive. EU officials just do not believe in the success of the spring counteroffensive. Bloomberg claims that hopes have been dampened with a 30 kilometer or 20 mile advance now seen as a realistic objective. So we're not talking about taking the Donbass or taking Crimea anymore. We're now talking about a 30 kilometer territorial gain as being seen as a success in this spring counteroffensive. So they're definitely lowering expectations for the spring counteroffensive. As a matter of, fa of fact, the Bloomberg article even says that some EU officials believe that this, this big spring offensive should be seen more as, as an appetizer, as an hors d'oeuvre before an even bigger offensive 
takes place in 2024. In other words, they're saying this spring offensive is going to be more like a pre, a pre big offensive for 2024. <laughs> it's going to be the opening act of what's going to be a much, much bigger thing in about a year's time. So that is what Bloomberg is reporting. But nevertheless, several European defense officials have told reporters that the counteroffensive, which the Ukrainian leadership has been hyping up for several months now, is likely to get underway by mid-May. Strikes may be expected from multiple directions, potentially including diversionary ones, Bloomberg's sources alleged. in May, to coincide perhaps with Russia's Victory Day parade. That would be my, my best guess, given the obsession that the collective West and the Alensky, ha and the Alensky regime has with, with media narratives. So that is what Bloomberg is reporting. Let's now do a clown world, and we will wrap this video up. And this will be a quick clown world. The Alensky regime, they have sanctioned the Chinese giant, giant tech and mobile handset manufacturer, Xiaomi. They have sanctioned Xiaomi. That is what the Alensky regime has done. Xiaomi responded to the sanctions by saying that every Consumer around the world has the right to access communications and information on the internet. And the reason that the Alensky regime sanctioned Xiaomi is because they found out that Xiaomi is actually operating in Russia. They're still operating in Russia. They're still selling handsets in Russia. And the Alensky regime, they claim that Xiaomi is sponsoring Putin's war. So... They have been sanctioned by Alensky. <laughs> so Alensky sitting in his office and his advisor, let's just say Podoliak, his advisor comes in and he says, uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, um, I've got some news that I need to tell you. It looks like Xiaomi is, uh, is operating in Russia. Uh, Xiaomi. What is this Xiaomi? Uh, Mr. President, Xiaomi is a Chinese company that manufactures technology and mobile phones. A very, very big company that makes mobile phones and they are still selling their phones in Russia. Mm. Mobile phones, you say, eh? Mm. Mobile phones, good business, very good business. Very, very good business. Lots of money, mobile phones. Lots of money. Podoliak, let me ask you a question. Maybe, maybe Xiaomi has two, three billion dollars to give me so I can buy home, maybe? Uh, Mr. President, I, I, I don't think Xiaomi's gonna give you two, three billion dollars to buy a home. No? Well then, sanction. Sanction Xiaomi. How dare they not give me billions of dollars to buy a home put them on sanctions just say that they are sponsoring putin's war and and podoliak get trudeau on the phone whenever i call trudeau that idiot he always gives me money <laughs> that's the video everybody uh, the duran.locals.com we are on Rockfin, Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, and Telegram, and go to the Durant shop, 10% off. Use the code Good Day. I'm wearing my light hoodie with the flag of Kenya. I'm also wearing a Durant t-shirt. I also have a Durant, a Durant backpack right here, so I am decked out in Durant gear. And check out our Durant shop page on Instagram. Take care.